Hello and welcome back everyone to another series of Moneyball. Yes, we are back doing yet another Moneyball series, but it's going to be a little bit different to how we've done it before. So this series is going to be a Moneyball general manager series. So in this series, we're going to incorporate the role that Billy Bean would have had at the Oaken Days in terms of being more of a general manager, not having the day-to-day -day responsibilities of the team. Yeah, we're going to call it Moneyball general manager to separate it from the other Moneyball series that we've done in the past. So in this series, I'm going to be responsible for all of the transfers and all of the incomings and outgoings of the club, both playing staff and coaching staff and all the recruitment staff and everything else in between. I won't be taking the matches day today. We'll be leaving that to our assistant manager, which will essentially be the manager. I guess effectively how you've got to look at it is even though we are the manager of the club uh, per se, really we're not. The assistant manager, whoever that is, is really the manager. They're going to be doing everything in terms of coaching, tactics, etc. And we're going to be responsible only for the transfers and the recruitment of the players. So that means we'll be holidaying past matches generally. However, what I have done also is I've got myself added as a secondary manager here with uh, no club attached. Now, what that means is I can holiday the games as the club that I'm in control of, but I can still watch the matches. So I can still watch the matches of my assistant manager taking the team, him playing his tactics. We can still watch those matches without being fully in control of them. And we can watch them in live real time, which is absolutely brilliant. So that's how it's going to work. Obviously, I'll be watching all of the matches. I'll be watching mainly the matches that mean something. So probably watch the first game of the series and then promotion games, relegation games, cup finals, all that kind of stuff, right? That's the kind of games that we'll actually be watching together in this series. But apart from that, be largely us trying to build the team and doing everything from a Moneyball perspective. Now, Moneyball in FM means that we're going to be using no attributes, using stats only to buy players, recruit players, and team select players. That is loosely how the save is going to work. We can go into some more details here in a second. If you're not familiar with what the term Moneyball means, um, I'm going to link the episode one of my Paris Moneyball series, where I explain it in a bit more detail and how it sort of developed into, into football. But in short, it's a book that was written Around 2003, I think it was, it came out. It was based on the Oakland A's, or a baseball team. And it's based on their sort of seasons between 2001 and 2003. Uh, the reason is that they were a small market team with a very low budget. And they just lost their three best players. And they had to find a way to replace them without the usual means. They couldn't just go and get like for like because those players didn't exist for the money they had. So that's got a different method, a different way. And they went to go on a very uh, stats-heavy approach, which about is as loose as I can, I can put it. Um, and that sort of make, brings me on to to one point that um, that I wanted to, to sort of, I guess, acknowledge that a lot of people are doing stats-based or Moneyball-type FM saves. And it's very hard to sort of like correlate it across. Right? You've got to think back to when this came about. This book was written in 2003 about a team that was playing in 2001 in a different sport completely. So um, a huge difference between baseball and football is that in baseball, especially back then before the shift would uh, would occur, is you've got the hitter and the pitcher. And there's not too many variables outside of that, you know, quite often. There are obviously how many players are out, how many people are on base, a few things like that. But you can really nail down the variables to a very small amount. Uh, it's a sport where you're only playing one side of the ball at the time. Like either you're fielding or you're hitting. You're not doing one and the other within the same few seconds. It's not a continuous sport. So it's very hard to apply something that happened in baseball straight into football for that. For, for that reason among among many others also other factors back then not a lot of teams were really using data analysis properly back in 2003 so obviously it was a bit different back then because they sort of had that head start they were one of the first teams to properly adopt the uh the bill james stuff that was going on in the saber metrics of, of, of baseball so they were one of the early teams to sort of get around and, and to do that and uh, that's that played a part the third thing that makes a huge difference between i think baseball back then and football today is they're looking at the Major League Baseball, they're looking at the double and triple A divisions, which are the divisions below the top division. And they can sort of gauge, and the college system, high school system, but they can sort of gauge a player's stats to roughly how that's going to look for a player when they get to the top league. They can compare it to other players that made it, what they look like at that lower level. And it's like an easier structure to sort of play somebody. How do they look at this level, this level, this level, et cetera, right? In football, there isn't a standard one to five tier system, right? You're looking all over the world in different standards of football, different leagues where you're playing in a league where there's a lot of teams that play three at the back or in a lot of teams that play a low block or the opposite, etc. There's many other variables that you're looking at when you start to looking at players in league systems in the world, in football league systems where nothing directly correlates. The second tier in England is not the same second tier in Spain or the same second tier in Scotland or the same second tier in Wales, etc., etc., right? 
it's not as simple as that. There's a lot more nuanced things you need to look out for. So it's very hard to just apply a basic stats only metric to things in real life. So I think that considering the time that this sort of method was invented, the, the amount of different leagues that you're looking at and the variables of that and the sports, again, all the variables you have in football, 22 players on the field at the same time, either in possession, out of possession, transition, every attacks, defends, etc. And there aren't that many subs. It used to only be three, of course. Now you can make the five over three stoppages ordinarily. But you think of any other sport, think of basketball, American football, hockey, rugby, any of these sports, they all have something that makes it not quite like football. You think about uh, American football is a set piece sport effectively. Everybody's from a dead ball position and you are you are on your own side of the ball, then the ball goes live. And you get a lot of stop and repetition from that, right? It's a lot of stop start in terms of the movements and you get to reset completely. So if you end up doing something bad and you give up a big play, you get to reset. Again, the ball may have moved, but you get to reset from a set position. The ball isn't continuous, right? You're not you're not one you're not attacking and then defending within the same thing unless there's a turnover. But generally speaking, you get what I mean. Uh, in that in, in that essence, uh, in basketball, you do have a bit more of that. There's a lot of stoppages, and also I think subs are easier to do on the on the fly. Um, then you've got hockey, where players play no more than what ninety seconds, two minute shifts, and they're in and out. And then rugby, you've got where although in rugby is very similar to football in terms of like numbers on the fields, how often subs are made. Even though it's got that similarity to football, you're always on your own side of the ball. So. You're not getting the sort of cross reference of being uh, creating width and depth in terms of like being yeah, being either side of the ball, attacking and defending immediately, and it all getting a bit messy. You're always on your own side of the ball, as it were, right? So the reason I'm mentioning all of that is it's very hard to take something from one sport and just plug it into another. For example, you're going to see people like the Brentford owner who has got a club that are very analytical and stats driven in a lot of the approach stuff that they do, but they hit this a money ball. Because what they do isn't money ball, you know. It is far more nuanced than that, and uh, yeah, I think I don't think he likes that term very much at all. So, a brief little, yeah, I guess explanation for me of how different stats can be in different sports and why it's hard to just take something from one, plug it into another. You have to adapt and evolve it with your own with your own sports. But crucially, what's very very important as well is then how you take it from football after. So you take all those variables. We take all those differences, plug it into football, and then again from football to football manager. And it's not the same thing, really. There's a few different things in football manager that you need to consider. And the way that the game is is designed and made will affect how you'll maybe do things in football manager you may not have done in real life if you're a scout at a real club or, or a director of football or any kind of recruitment kind of uh, role. So yeah, these things are important to consider when talking about Moneyball. The reason I, I brought all of this in at the start was to basically say, you can see that taking the original concept of Moneyball, you can take it in your own direction. And, and you know, somebody somebody doing a Moneyball save in FM can be different to somebody else. And there's no real wrong way of, of doing it. If you're, if you're doing it and you're enjoying it from my perspective, that is the best thing to see so many people take this now with all the new skins that have been added to the game by the wonderful community, all the new stats that are in the game, thanks to the wonderful additions from, from uh, sports interactive with the, with FM 23, there's so much more stats you can do than you could never have done before. And this is a concept that goes all the way back to the old forums before there were any visual content creators in FM is when I remember seeing somebody talk about doing this for the first time. So it's, um, yeah, a really, really interesting concept um that i love to do i love these series i know people love to watch them i don't know how many people actually do it themselves or if they just like to watch people do them i'm not quite sure on that uh but uh yeah i love these these series and if you're doing it at home in your own time do let me know how one if you are doing it two how you're doing it in your specific way so how the save is going to work we're going to play as afc wimbledon now the reason i picked afc wimbledon I'm going to link the documentary on the club down below in the description. Uh, obviously, for those that aren't familiar with AFC Wimbledon, they were a club that went extinct and were reformed in 2002. They were they were in the Football League. They were a professional club and they had to restart all the way down in the depths of the football pyramids. And as a club to restart, they held an open training session. Literally anybody could turn up and uh, trial for the club. And it's a proper grassroots starting at the bottom and working your way back up um, sort of story. And then for those that aren't aware, Sports Interactive played a big role early on in sponsoring the club and trying to help them, I guess, financially with a bit of money. Uh, that It gets mentioned in the documentary and they try and help them get a head start, as it were. 
And now here they are today in League 2, which is where they are right now, where we're going to pick them up anyway. So for those of you familiar with the Oakland A story and the original money bought in the book and in the film, of course, uh, they're a very small market team with not as much money. And I'm guessing from our perspective, once we even get promoted once, definitely twice, we're definitely going to be in that sort of frame. So we're definitely going to be in that small market sort of situation. My aim is to try and run the club financially stable. So to try and keep it healthy at all times. So yes, we will be the general manager of AFC Wimbledon, like I mentioned earlier on, that could be responsible for all of the transfers, etc. And in terms of like how we're going to scout players, again, if you'd like to see this in detail right now, I can point you in the direction of my Paris series where we go through the whole step-by-step -step process. But in short, what I will look to do is at the end of the season. So if I want to use a stats-based approach to search for players, what stats am I looking for? Now, there's two things that I can look at. One, I have got FM Stag stats in this skin. So if I was to click on a player here, let's go Will Nightingale. If I was to go on him, advanced statistics, eventually get some stats here. Um, he will get compared to these stats here. So this is FM Stag stats in the skin. So what this shows is the average of players across Europe. So all of these stats here that you can see, that is the top five leagues in Europe, uh, the top player taken. So for example, here, the top center back in the top five leagues in Europe, add all their stats together, divide them by five, and that's how you get the average. So for a, for a poor player, uh, tackles per 90 would be around 1.03, for a medium player, 1.29, and for a good player, 2.83. So you'd see where he fits into that once he's played some games, of course. The other way I like to do it, though, is to try and keep it specific to the league that I'm playing in right there and right now. So what I would do is I would take three teams instead of five in my own league. So for example, if I was trying to get into the playoffs, I would take, say, Crew Crawling Colchester's stats for their strikers. Um, in fact, I could show you here. If I was to go to Colchester, I could have my Moneyball striker view in here. So this is my striker view. So what I would do is take, I would sort it by goals, obviously when they've scored some goals, and I would take Colchester's best striker, I would take Crawley's best striker, and whoever else the other team was, I take their best striker, and put them into my spreadsheet. The spreadsheet calculates, it adds all of their stats up, then it divides it by three, and that gives you an average. Now, why would you do it three times instead of just taking 18? Because, for example, if Colchester are playing a very direct 4-3-3, they're going to have likely a six foot three plus big man striker. And if I just take their stats, I'm going to be taking taking that. Three is probably the minimum where you can sort of give you an average. Like two of the teams might have like a big man, but the, the other team might have like a little Aguero mold type striker. Obviously not that good because it's League Two, but that kind of mold striker. And that would then bring down the average. It sort of just eliminates the extremes, right? And it sort of gives you the best chance of uh, not having the extremes kill you. It's always seems to work pretty well. And the other good thing is, obviously, those exact stats that we're looking for is what got the teams to finish 7th, 6th, and 5th. So in theory, if I was able to get the centre-back stats from these three teams, full-back, striker, central field player, if I was able to get all these stats from these teams, divide them by three, and then I'm able to get players with those exact stats, in theory, I should be finishing 5th, 6th, and 7th, in theory. That's how the theory goes. And again, in real life, there'd be so many extra variables, uh, team style for those three teams, was it a low point season? There are so many things that you could go into to why you probably wouldn't do that in real life. But in terms of the game, to add a benchmark to aim for, I feel like that's the best way to do it because this is a specific target. So rather than just taking the best player, and the reason I don't like taking the best player, for example, in like FM Stag stats, uh, especially in this kind of situation in League Two, is it's very likely those players played for the top teams. So a centre-back in a team like Manchester City isn't going to be put in the same situations as a centre-back for these two teams here. And as that's the level of realistically targeting, we can realistically aim for those stats, right? That's how I try to apply the money ball system to recruit players. That's my benchmark and the aim that I go for. So yeah, in theory, if you buy the equivalent stats of players that finished 5th, 6th and 7th in the league, you should end up with a team that finishes 5th, 6th or 7th, as long as those stats are from players in a equal or similar league because obviously if, if somebody's getting really good stats playing in the 25th tier of English football you've got to factor that in and again it's something that goes back to you've got to factor in standard of football when you're looking at stats especially in FM there aren't be really easy ways to weight that in real life between between divisions but within the game it's very hard to do that I find so it's easier to just I uh, go off this and look, look for divisions that are very close by so for us we'd be looking at league two National League. We could look at National League North and South, especially if there are players that are really excelling on certain on certain uh, stats. And obviously, if if I'm going away from an equivalent league, if I'm going away from a League Two league, going down to Vanarama North and South, 
there's a good chance that if they're a better player in their league, they're not necessarily going to have the same exact stats. They could be a little off from the stats we're looking for. And that's where you need to be a bit more clever and nuanced, where maybe I do use some of FM stag stats. Or, and if they're playing in a better team in their respective league, maybe maybe their central field player doesn't have as many tackles per 90 because he's always attacking and hiring the pitch. So you've got to start to be a bit more clever and nuanced about it. But in terms of a benchmark, that's how I look for the benchmark first. And then I scale away from that point. Like, as I'm saying, the reason I'm explaining this is that is how I go about it first and what I look for first, but that isn't the only way to scout because there are multiple different ways you could look You could look for players. And the final part to it, I would say, is looking for value, looking for where players are undervalued in the market by, by everybody else. So a good example might be if you're playing like a 4-3-3 kind of system, wingers are traditionally very, very hard to buy in moneyball type saves because if they're a good wide player, they're quick, with good dribbles per 90 and creative, they're normally worth an awful lot of money and it's really hard to get those players cheap, right? So that's a huge, huge problem. So, okay, can't get a winger, but uh, how many teams are playing with two strikers in, in the areas you're looking at, in the leagues you're looking at? Now, in that strike force, there's likely to be one of them that's going to be slightly smaller and quicker than the other. Now, what you might find is there might be some really good young quick strikers who didn't score that many, but they've got extremely good dribbles per 90 and they've played in a successful strike force, but they've not been scoring the goals, which means that they may not be worth that much money. So you might end up being able to get a striker in a two-man strike force for less money than buying a winger, but his stats may work for you as a winger. That's another way you could go about it, right? Again, from my perspective, initially, I will look for players directly in their position just because of the way FM works. A striker, especially in FM, could score quite different stats uh, to a wide player and it's very hard sometimes to compare them in real life it's it's a lot easier to take those things into consideration because when buying a player from a team you aren't necessarily going to play him in exactly the same position in exactly the same style of football against the same exact level of opposition right so looking at stats from a position perspective isn't always um i guess the the be all end all approach but in foot manager again going back to that football versus foot manager conversation in foot manager it might be something that is easier to correlate with because of the way the game is run. But it might not be. That's a decision for, I guess, you to make if you're playing it yourself. I will make as well as I go. I don't tend to do that as often. The only time I ever really do that is if I'm playing three at the back with wing backs and I'll look for a winger that can defend a little bit. That's generally where I will look to do something like that. But again, it's another different way you could approach doing your your, your searching. Why it's not as simple as just, I guess, going... Here's the benchmark. We're only going to get players with that benchmark. You can move outside of that target, as it were. Uh, one big tip is make sure you save your game at the end of every season. Now, the reason for this is obviously the stats get reset every year in FM. So if you'd like to go back in years and view players' stats in previous seasons, you need to make sure you make a separate save game file at the end of each season, which I've got into the habit of doing, so it's normally okay for me, famous last words. But I'm normally pretty good at being able to, to get that. So highly recommend that. And in our position as Wimbledon manager, that's going to be really, really important because there might be players that we can't sign until like July 2nd and they've all been released from their clubs, etc. But when we go to sign them on a free, we can't see their stats anymore. So what you can do here is in like January, if you're in the European League, something like that, you can look at whose contract is going to expire at the end of the season. If you're in League 2, League 1, you're going to be facing a lot of free agents. So it's, going to be your, it's going to be your best way to improve the team quickly, right? But uh, you can't wait for them to expire, then try and see their stats is going to be gone. The best way to do it, I would say, is go expire in six months, take off the interested thing and just list down a load of players. And then when you go to the next year, see who's actually interested in coming to you that you've had on your shortlist. And when it comes to actually offering them the contract, you can then go back and look at their stats to see what you think is the right value for their for their stats. Putting a numerical value on on certain stats is, I guess, really important as well in a, in a Moneyball type type save. I'm not going to go into that right now because that could be different for so many reasons between the teams that you're playing as, that etc., etc. Because um, it can scale depending on how much money you've got. I don't think you have to have no money for it to be a Moneyball save. The Boston Red Sox famously took the concept from the Oakland days and Billy Bean and did it themselves with a much bigger budget. I don't think it has to be a team with no money for it to be a Moneyball save. You can do it with anybody and use it as an approach. Obviously, you just have the ability to go higher if you choose to. But generally, teams that did it out of necessity early on, that's why it became a big thing, of course. Okay, so in terms of how exactly this is going to work this save, I'm opening up to a little bit of maneuvering on this. But at least in the initial stages, I'm going to be technically, obviously, the manager. And the manager is going to be the assistant manager. So you can see here, Johnny Jackson, who is the manager at the start of the game, he is going to be the assistant manager at AFC Wimbledon. He's going to take over as the assistant, and he's going to be here with us. 
I think for this sort of approach to working in football in real life, you obviously need a very, very close synergy between the person doing the recruiting and the manager. And hopefully somebody who understands a bit of both. So a manager that understands the recruitment aspect of the of the whole business and somebody in the recruitment room that really understands creating a playing philosophy and game model and that kind of stuff and how that sort of interacts. So we're going to try and bring in similar managers and similar coaching staff with a sort of uh, playing philosophy in mind to a, to a point anyway. We're going to, first of all, keep it, keeping it simple, we're going to try and make sure that we get coaches that play four at the back systems. So either 4-3-1, 4-3-3, 4-4-2, but uh, something that's four at the back to avoid uh, any problems with them selecting teams in a different in a different shape on a regular basis anyway. So I'm going to take one of our coaches here at the club, uh, Rob Tovey here. Now, the first thing we look at then is preferred formation 4-3-1, which is good. Uh, the second thing we look at is tactical style. So it can be any of the following. It could either be Gigan Press, as he's got here. It could be control possession, ticker tag or vertical ticker tag. Any of these, maybe something like wing play and that we could look at as well. But uh, in pretty much in like hierarchy, the golden scenario would be to have Gigan Press, um, a control possession. Me, for me, those are the two ones that I'm looking for for the way that I want us to sort of buy players in towards. Yeah, I'm not too bothered about the ticker tag. I'm not too bothered about us becoming the next Manchester City. Not in terms of this save. Now, again, for this kind of series, if this series does well, I'd like to make multiple of these and having completely different, um, I guess, playing philosophies and game models to try and buy towards. So I'm not too set on that on this one. Just that generally want it to be four at the back. We want it to be uh, either geek and press or control possession. Control possession is my most ideal one because I want us to be able to control the game, be good in transition and try. I guess we're looking more, less less like Pep, I guess more like a, a Bielas or a De Zerbi kind of team. That's sort of, I guess, more in my head of what we're going to try and buy players for the managers to try and to try and achieve. And we'll see how they go go doing that. So it's basically geek and press control possession is great. If not, vertical tick attacker or tick attacker is okay. Maybe wing play would be okay. And then anything outside of that is pretty much non-starter. We won't bother to recruit them, especially as a manager. Playing star standard, that's fine, obviously, for this guy. And then second preferred formation, I don't really mind that, to be honest, because they won't use that that often. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's what we're going to do. We're going to try and pick coaches based on like a hierarchy of, of a philosophy. And that's how we're going to recruit staff. It's, it's purely on this. We're going to ignore reputation completely. Uh, apart from the manager, the manager we will try to get recognizable names if I can. I'll try to use either real coaches now or current players in the game that retired rather than getting new gens. Coaching staff, I don't care, but managers, I'll try and do that because it's more interesting for everybody else, right? People watching can have a relation to who, who the manager is. In terms of the manager, if we were to sack the manager, there's two things in my mind we, we could do. Because if I just sign them normally, it's only going to let me sign really assistants. So in my head, what I was thinking is, and again, this is one of the things that you can tell me in the comments how you'd like it to really go. But uh, we could just take managers from other clubs in leagues below us or clearly where we are a step up from another club. If we do that, and I was to use like the editor to sort of replicate that, that happening, um, what we could do with that is mandate a 20% wage increase. So whoever we get, whatever wages they're on, it's an automatic 20% bump on their wages because that's fairly realistic. I think something like that would be would be realistic. Maybe more, I don't know. Let me know what you think about think about that. And uh, maybe we play some compensation. It might do it automatically. I'm not sure. I've not really done it before. I don't use the editor that often, to be honest. But this save requires it for it to for it to work. But uh, yeah, we'll have a look at that. I mean, I could just go like make it ridiculous. I like, get Bielsa immediately off the bat. But that's uh, oh, that was a little bit like we'll try and keep it within within realism, of course. So we'll keep the same manager as they had. They just appointed him. We'll keep him for now. Um, there isn't somebody that stands up like I want this person. So well, at least I haven't really looked for that. We'll just we'll get it going and we'll see how see how he goes. So he just about fits in tactical style. He fits okay in pro formation. Playing style direct. So that isn't something that I particularly like. But uh, we'll give him a go at the start. But that's not really what I want. But we'll see. Like if that was 4-4-2. If that was my least. If that was 4-4-2 with wing playing direct. I'd be concerned. Because it's 4-2-3-1 DM. With, with DMs. With pivots. I feel like that that could still work well. With the players that I recruit. Bringing in. Uh, good good wide players that have got a bit of technique to them. We'll look at open play key passes, that kind of stuff. I feel like that we can still get the philosophy out that we want by giving in the players to make that work, I feel like. I feel like we can work with him, basically, is what I'm saying. But he's like the limit of it. If he had a flat 4 4 2, which would be like borderline acceptable here, borderline acceptable here, then that wouldn't be acceptable. That was like basically that equals out to not being good enough, I think. So, but uh, he's fine for now. In terms of the finances, I'm going to try and stay within our means. I'm going to try and keep the club um, afloat. It doesn't even always be in the plus. We might run into the red a little bit. Clubs do run into the red, knowing they're going to get money into the season. But we're going to 
We're going to try and avoid that. We're going to try and spend within our means. Club has only got, has got no debt at all. I'm actually making some money in here. Um, although it says here, a couple of bank... Why does it say nothing there? Oh, okay, they finish soon. That's why. Okay, so yeah, those two loans are going to be gone really soon. Yeah, so that's that's fine. Effectively debt-free then. Uh, projection is currently... Yeah, good. So we're in the pluses at the moment, according to this. Yeah, in terms of tactics, I'll probably plug one in just that they're training something and getting familiar to something during preseason. But I will let the assistant manager play, or the manager. I should start referring to the assistant manager as the manager. I'll let the manager play his own tactic completely with no influence for me whatsoever. But at least they're, they're training and learning something throughout the season. I feel like that... Otherwise, I feel like they might be always be... Uh, otherwise, I feel like they might be always just playing with no tactical familiarity whatsoever. So we'll try that, I think. I'll come up with maybe one... Like, my own default tactic, I'll always keep the same. I'll play one with their formation and tweak it so it's slightly different to mine, and then maybe their second preferred formation. Maybe I'll train that, because then we're covering their two formations, plus the club's DNA, as it were. That sounds right to me. That, that works. I didn't pre-plan that. I just That sort of came out. That, was, that sounds like it works pretty good, actually. Obviously, the first season isn't going to require too much from us, so it will likely be that we, we watch the first game together at some point uh, later at the end, end of this episode, and then... I guess we're just sort of waiting to see how things go and see what we feel like we need and see, see how things are going really and, and see if we do need to do anything in January, if we need to sell some players, bring some players in, offer players contracts, keep players at the club, all that kind of stuff. I'm looking forward to this. I mean, this is going to be really exciting. I'm really interested to see how this sort of goes and to know that we can fly through the seasons so quickly by holidaying. I'm really excited to see to see how all the all the players develop really and uh, and how we can... We can get players and move them on and see, yeah, see how the squad develops, really, with the managers. I'm interested to see how the manager gets on because, yeah, it's interesting for the first time. I can't control what happens in the matches, but uh, we'll definitely be able to see how the team plays, which would be interesting. As you can see as well, there's no uh, there's no attributes on of any kind. In terms of how we do a reveal, again, that's something I'll leave up to you. So in the Paris save, what I did is after after the third season... I showed all the players that we let go in season one. And then every year, so like then season four, you would see season two, season five, you'd see season three. It would just keep going like that. So you'd always see players that left the club two years ago. But um, that's because I was using them. Do let me know how you would like to see it. Would you like me just to reveal the whole squad's attributes every two or three years, like our own squad? Or would you like me to do it when the players have left the club? Um, yeah, give me some ideas. What do you think in terms of player attribute reveals how you'd like that to go? For the first season, we'll leave it off. So there's no rush from my perspective to, to worry about that. But uh, yeah, be interesting to see how people uh, think that should go. One last thing from me. Um, if you haven't done already, go and check out Kirk, which is Game Style Stories um, over on YouTube. I'll put his link down below. He does a very similar save, similar type of save to this. It's a bit different, I think. Um, when I originally did my Moneyball save, the very first one, I had this save down to do alongside it. I was going to do two originally. And when I started the first one, I had two thoughts. One, it was too similar to my other one that I didn't think it would really interest people doing two at the same time. And the other thing was it took so much time. The other one, I thought there's no way I could do two. So I've always wanted to do this. And when I saw that Kirk had done something similar, I was really pleased to see that somebody had gone off and done it. I've managed to follow it too closely, but when I've seen bits of it, he's done a fantastic job. So go and give him a follow if you'd like to see a similar type save to this. Um, I think he calls his director of football, so it's a bit different to mine. And uh, yeah, do give him a follow. I think it's just brilliant to see people do a moneyball approach in no matter how it comes about. Like I said at the start of the video, early on in the video, if you're doing a moneyball save in any sort of way or form, everybody's going to do it a bit differently because of the time they've got, their interest level of putting the effort in, how much they hate themselves. Like obviously, I hate myself a lot to be able to put myself on their attributes doing these things. There's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. And everyone does it slightly differently. So yeah, do give him a do go give him a follow. Check his check his stuff out. So, and yeah, and yeah, like I said, so many people that have done these kind of says have all done it slightly differently. Again, for me, there's no really there's not really a wrong answer. Um, although somebody did come into my uh, into to my YouTube uh, series, the Paris one early on, and they were happy that I signed a player that was like 33 on a free transfer and said it wasn't a money ball signing. And the reason was I didn't sign somebody young and sell them high, and it just showed that they did not understand um, what. Moneyball was essentially. I mean, all you need to do is watch the film. Just watch the film. Don't read the book. Watch the film, 
And when the Oakland Days signed David Justice, who's a old player, way past his best, on a huge contract from the Yankees, and the Oakland Days get him on a deal where the Yankees are paying part of his wages, and he's a player that's declining in his ability, in his stats, in everything, and the Oakland Days' point to him is that they didn't sign him for the player he used to be, they signed him for the player that he is right now, and right now... The price that they paid for him, let's just make up two million a year, whatever it is, whatever price they were paying for him right now was worth it for their team to try to try and win. So, so it worked out for them. It was a good deal. But he was he was well past his best. He was a much older player. There was no resale value. They weren't trading him away for anything. They were going to keep him for a short, short period of time. But it was the right move. Statistically, it was the right move for them. It fit into what they needed in that moment, in that position. And they're able to get good value for money where nobody else wanted to touch him because his, his legs had gone or whatever the... I guess the the perceived notion was towards him, but they saw a player that was still useful for them within their system, batting at a certain place in the order, all that kind of stuff, right? So it worked for them. And I had a very similar situation. I had a CD, I had a, I had a holding midfield player on a free transfer who had excellent headers one per 90, tackle win ratio, is open by key passes. Was good. He basically was the best holding player that I could get. And by quite some distance, and the only other player I could really could, could get was like a youngster for like two or three million. And I didn't have much money to spend, so I went for went for the option that gave me the best chance to to succeed. And uh, the whole moneyball process spit him out as my option, so that's what I went for. Right, I think we've actually covered everything. Now, there's going to be future episodes where I go through exactly step-by-step step how I scout for my players. I haven't done it in this episode because I know it's going to be long anyway, and it'd be easier to like specify that on an episode later in in the series when we're actually scouting for players. So I'll give you a full step-by-step of how I do it, what I'm doing, show you my uh, my spreadsheet that I use, and I'll show you all the links to it. But again, if you want to see any of that right now, go to the Paris series, watch the first few episodes of that, and you'll get straight to that that point anyway. This, the process won't change too much in terms of what we did there. The only difference really from the Paris save to this save in terms of recruitment is, especially because I'm not playing matches, I'm going to spend a lot of time searching for players, a lot more time. So where maybe... It got to a point where I just had to move on to like the next bit of the of the season, etc. I'm happy now to go back through one, two, three years. I'm happy to just spend loads of time searching for players because that's our only job really here is to try and get the players out right and decide who the coaching staff are and that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm more happy to go back through back through seasons, spend just loads of time scouting for players, uh, looking at leagues manually, which I normally do anyway. But yeah, I guess the only difference is like here, I'm going to go through, you know, almost all the players in the National League and National, maybe North and South, but mainly in the National League and just go through things way more in depth than I would have done before. Instead of relying on the scouts, we're going to basically be doing it all ourselves, I guess, mostly. So I think that's going to do it for now. I guess you're going to see me in a second then. We'll uh, we'll finish off the episode, I think, with the first game of the season. I think that's the most sensible thing to do. I like to always get us underway. So... Between now and the first game, I'm going to just clear up some of the coaching staff. Anybody who doesn't fit into our philosophy, like we said before. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention on the coaches is personality. So in addition to all the things that I said, for the coaching staff especially, but maybe the manager as well, we'll look at it in terms of like model citizen, model professional, perfectionist and professional, those are the, and fairly professional. Those are the sort of categories in that order we're going to look for. So if we get a model citizen with control possession, 4 2 3 one, and short passing, etc. If, if we get somebody fits all of those categories, then we've got somebody who's perfect. But that's the sort of metric we're going to go with as well, is the personality is going to be very, very important for us in terms of coaching staff. But uh, in reality, the other bits are more important to keep the philosophy the same. The personality is something that's really like a, like a stretch goal. If we can get it, that's great. As we become a Premier League side, we can maybe make that more important. But right now, it's quite hard to get that. But that's also something else that we'll uh, we'll be considering. So I'm going out. I'm going to get the coaching staff together. There won't be too many changes, just a few little ones here and there. And uh, I'll change probably some of these uh, friendlies over. And I'll see you for the first game against Gillingham. We'll play that game, watch it together. And uh, yeah, we might just leave it there. I think we'll probably end it there. We'll come back in the next episode, having holidayed through some more of this. So I'll see you in a second for the game against Gillingham. So actually, before we go and look at the first game of the season, I thought I'd show you my sort of staff search. I've been looking through here, trying to get people that don't have a club, trying to get their personality down to one of the options that we've said and trying to get the tactical style to something. And I've looked at the formation as well. So we're looking at Mark Bradshaw here. So he's got tactical style of control possession, preferred uh, formations 4-3-3, which is good, playing style standard. This is pretty good. He fits in really, really well. So I'd like to get him in as probably a first team coach more than anything. So he's going to come in and that's going to be good for us. So Colm Ebert, this guy's going to be our under-18s manager. He fits a lot of the stuff that we're looking for, actually. 
Um, actually, I don't think we have Lenore, his manager anymore, so he's going to come and be that. He fits everything, which is good. Okay, so we've just been through that. That is going to be your new list. A lot of those are actually new gens. Like I said, the, I'm going to try and keep, like I said, I'm going to keep the, the manager to being a real manager at all times. I don't think I'll even change from that. I'll try and keep that as a rule throughout, that the manager will always be a real, uh, a real manager uh, of some sorts. Uh, either as a current staff member now or as a player in the game that becomes a staff member. But if everybody else, if they're a coaching staff member, they, fa they fit into the categories that we've said. Physios and sports scientists, I've not really cared too much about that. But yeah, everybody else there. But yeah, that is going to do that. I've handed over pretty much everything to the staff in every area except for signing players. So they're going to run the club from this point forwards. I think I might change the friendlies for the first pre-season. Then after that, the manager can just do it themselves. But uh, yeah, I just feel like that we want to get off to a good start here. I will always try, if I can, to keep the squad low enough where everybody fits onto one screen so that if I need to, I can just take myself off the screen and you can see everybody's stats. Because my this is my default view for those who don't follow my, my saves ordinarily. My main view fits just about on the screen here. You can see everything that you need to see just about. It covers as many generic areas as possible, but I've got different ones for different positions. So if I wanted to look at, um, for example, my striker view, which would be this one here. Again, you can see all of them, but now they're all focused mainly on, obviously, stats for a striker. So, yeah, we've got those if we need them, but we don't need them just yet. That'll be for when we look at reviewing the pliers and that kind of stuff later on. It feels quite nice, you know. It feels really weird not having to worry about training. I mean, I could worry about training. I'm not going to. I could think about uh, training, the individual training, traits, all that stuff. That is all just somebody else's problem for once. We're going to sit back, relax, and see how the team starts, I guess. And then, yes, see where we're at. As the season goes on, so I'll see you all in a few weeks' time for the game against Gillingham. Okay, then here we go. First game of the season. I can't wait for this. It's going to be such a different feeling during the game. Right, so let's take you through the process of what's going to happen here. First of all, there's your staff. I'm not going to run through it all. I showed you all it a second ago. Yeah, there it is because any of those names recognize are recognizable to you. But in terms of the game then so okay so what we're going to do now then is instead of playing the game obviously we're not going to playing it we're going to make sure first of all we go to the other manager the other manager in the save the one that's currently not assigned to a club and we'll make sure then we go to Wimbledon click on AFC Wimbledon go to their schedule and then click attend at the Gillingham Wimbledon match very important then we go back to the manager of Wimbledon and let's make sure we go on holiday now and the most important thing for us in this step is that we now go on holiday for one day, one day only. And what's also very important is we do not select use correct match tactics. Obviously, we want the manager to use his own tactics, not the one that we've set for him. So now we're going to click on go on holiday. And here we go, then. This is so different to be a part of this, isn't it? We are at the Wimbledon game, viewing the game in full live, not after the fact, as the other manager. So here we go. So he's gone 4-2-3-1. Okay. We're playing against a 4-4-2 flat. Nice, okay. Let's just get the, some stuff up here. So when we're watching matches, make sure we've got... Yeah, I'm going to be covering the pass map and their formation. Is that okay? Always have latest scores, the league table, our formation's there. I guess that's the most important one, isn't it? That you can see our stuff. I'm going to have to cover something, I guess. I think that works the most, right? I'm going to put opposition replays on as well, I think, because it's just a bit different, isn't it? I want to sit back a little bit. Let's sit back and relax and enjoy it. Enjoy this, this moment. Let's watch our team play some football. Obviously... It's not really a true money ball team for us yet because there's not been any transfers, but we're going to see how the team gets off at least from a starting perspective. Uh, 9,000 attendance here at this game. Nothing's happened yet. Here we go. First highlight. light. We're going to pick it up. Going to apply it into the middle. Uh, it looks like we've got an attacking right back. Looks like a wing back attack on the right. Looks like a full back support on the left just by looking at the, the player roles and where they're moving. And uh, I can see it plays it into our left-sided play. It goes inside, shoots, and it's not a great effort on goal. Well, so we're sat in the director's box as a general manager. Is Billy Bean in the stands watching our wonderful team play? Be coached by the manager. It's going to be really interesting, this, isn't it? See how it all uh, goes. Throwing here, all the highlights have been for Wimbledon so far. They've just punted it clear in their flat 4-4-2. they almost getting behind. Will not in-game what's up. What's interesting is, like, I think you're always conscious, most players are, if their defenders have got no paces, they break through, they're going to score. Oh, the keeper's had a nightmare, and it's 1-0 to Gillingham. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's quite interesting, now going purely off of stats in our recruitment, that I'm not going to be as bothered about the the pace of the players, because I'm assuming the managers are going to play quite different tactics to what the human player would would select generally. So I don't know, it's going to be interesting. I'm not going to be as worried about things. I'm going to be buying the best players in our Moneyball method, no questions asked. So... Gonna be interesting to see. It feels so funny. Like it's our team. It's the team that we're creating. We're playing as, but we're not in control of it. It's so funny. This such a good way to do it. 
I'm enjoying this. This is good. I mean, well, we're one nil down in red cards, but I mean, apart from that, it's it's been it's not a great start, is it? My only concern is we get relegated first season. That's uh, yeah, that's not going to be good. See, the elements of this where you need to you know break the game a little bit to make it to make this work is obviously it's not really set up for it. Like, if we were to sack the manager, for example, do we give the team a morale boost of that sort of new manager bounce for a couple of games? Like, do we start to do things like that? Do let me know if you've got any thoughts like that, how you think that we could make this better, more interactive and more realistic. Because, yeah, I guess if we were to sack the manager, the new manager will come in and play his way, but the team's going to still be as out of form and down as it was before that change because the game thinks that it's the same manager, right? So, yeah, do let me know if you've got any thoughts on, on that aspect of the series in particular. Come on, get a draw, get a draw. Oh, lads, come on. Yeah, obviously, you won't be watching too many matches. I think that generally this will be more about the chance. But I just thought we'd see the first game together. As uh, It's like, you know, put this like a time capsule. Let's, let's watch this together now and see how far we get removed from this position in multiple years. I don't know if I'll do like a whole season without showing you a single... Uh, there'll be an update in January a little bit because I'll probably show you... Well, first of all, an update on how things have been going. Um, or it could be that the episode is an update in January, an update at the end. Haven't fully decided how that's going to happen. Yes, the boys lost their first game 1-0 to Gillingham. Not the best start, lads, as it pushes right next to relegations and right off the bat. Um, but there we are. So there we go. That is how the save is going to go. I thought I'd show you one little process of how it all goes about. We're starting to see the stats populate a little bit here now. What's interesting is how we can force... I mean, we can force him to play the team that we want. It will just... He could just do it in his own tactic, but... Yeah, I don't know. I think for now, I probably won't do that. We'll see how bad it is. If he keeps selecting players that are clearly not as good as the others, or that we think... It, if he's not if he's not rotating the team enough and not playing our new wonder kid that we think is going to be really, really good, we can then look to enforce it potentially. But until we get to that point, not too worried. First season, he can do what he wants. Again, one of those things that I'd love to have your input on. There's a lot of things in this that... We, we can really stretch this quite far in how we do this, but I'd want to get a bit of a consensus from the people watching the series to see exactly where I take it. But you get the crux of it, right? We're going to be doing it like this, where I'll be playing as, as one manager, essentially, doing all the transfers, and the assistant manager is really the manager. We're the general manager. The other manager will view the matches if we want to watch a match together. But that, again, I don't think we'll watch another match until maybe January, likely not to the end of the season, if there's like relegation on the line or something that we need to watch. But um, I like the fact I can do this kind of save and we can still watch matches. Like, if we get to the Champions League final, it's not just we're sat there waiting for the game to take over a day on holiday and see what the result is. I'm glad that we can actually watch it together. I and mean, there's a way for us to do that and a way that works and it's pretty quick to do. So a bit fiddly and messing around, a bit of messing around for me, but that's that's all good. I'm happy to do to do that. But that is going to do it, I think. I think we're going to be done with the first episode. I think that's going to be a fairly lengthy one. I think I'm not too sure. Uh, but we've included a lot of information in in there. And uh, yeah, we'll return for January. We'll see how the first season sort of been going. And we'll see if there's any players that we've sort of sold. I might offer some contracts between now and then of players that have got their contracts up for uh, expiration at the end of the year. But again, not too much is going to happen early on. But I wanted to sort of show you the at least the first instance of what's happened. We saw the very first game. It was at home. We lost and got red card. So the only way is up from this point forwards. Jolly Jackson, mate. I'm the, I'm the GM now. You are under pressure already, my friends. I'm happy to sack you if things are going well. We can get somebody else in. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be sacking managers unnecessarily. The only thing that he's got against him is he's not really perfectly in line with what we're looking for in terms of this or personality. Again, their personality is more about the coaching staff, not the manager. It's more about this that we're looking for for the manager as we can't see how good they are, except for the reputation, of course, but we don't care about that. Everybody's got to start somewhere. We can have the next big thing as a manager. You never know. Right, that is going to do it. Thank you so much to all of you for watching and being a part of this first episode. I hope it does it does well, mainly because I love this concept of a series and if people are bought into it, it's going to be great to do together. I'm really excited to do this series. Um, it's a really good concept. It allows me to easily get through multiple, multiple seasons and keep it fun for everybody else watching. Um... So, yeah, and it also enables us to really go away from Wimbledon and um, not necessarily in this save. I mean, we could do, I don't know, but um, it really, my, my intention is to play with Wimbledon throughout this, this save, really. That's the whole idea of it. But it enables me, like I said, to do a save with, I don't know, maybe we do Stoke and we just buy players that are like tall, big, physical, good on set pieces and we build the whole Moneyball strategy around that. Maybe we do that. Maybe we do one as a team in Spain and try and recreate, you know, effectively a Pep style of, of, of football. There's all these different things and areas we can take this. Uh, maybe we do a, a journeyman save where we sort of use the Moneyball concept and jump club to club doing this sort of thing. Who knows? 
Um, all these things are on the table. This is something I really want to try. I hope it does well. I hope people do enjoy this as a concept. And I hope you enjoyed this first episode. Not too much of the Moneyball stuff, more about explaining what the series is about, how it's going to work more than anything else. But hopefully you enjoyed it. I appreciate all of you. And I'll see you all in January when hopefully we can get our first signings in the Moneyball system.